Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. Appreciate you saying it. Appreciate you being here this morning. 1 Thessalonians, chapter number 4. Very familiar portion of Scripture to our reading. God burdened my heart about this and this thought this morning. I pray that we'd heed what thus saith the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, we begin our reading verse 13. The Bible says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Our Father, I want to bless your holy name. Thank you for being a great God. Thank you for being our God. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we realize you stand in the shadows seeking one to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Lord, we realize you stand in the, gap, the shadows just looking to see if there's anyone wanting to act upon that measure of faith you've given. Lord, you stand in the shadows uh, inhabiting the praise of your people. Lord, you stand in the shadows, Lord, just looking for somebody who will look your way and trust for you to do great and mighty things which we know it's not. Now, Father, we ask that, Lord, you'd put a hedge about us now. We ask that you would certainly take over the service. We ask that you'd arrange the atmosphere for the message. Father, we ask that the devil would not be allowed to interfere, or, Lord, not to distract or divide anybody's attention. Father, we ask that, Lord, you would uh, take up your boat in such a way that you would not be denied. Father, I pray for every saint of God here this morning. God, I pray that, Lord, you would revive them, that, God, you would uh, help them to leave this place different than they came in. No telling the load they had, no telling the problems they faced, no telling the troubles that are uh, uh, encompassed in their buckets today. But, God, I pray they'd leave out victorious over all those things, trusting in Christ. Father, I pray if there's anybody here today that's saved, but Lord, not where they should be with God, I pray before the final amen, they'd get where they need to be. And then, Father, I pray if there's anybody in our service that is not saved, that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, thank you for the good news of the one being saved over at the jail this morning. We thank the Lord for that. Hallelujah. One more added to the Lamb's book of life. Father, thank you for the good singing. Thank you, Lord, for those that have been faithful to clean and faithful to manicure the lawns and faithful to work a job so they can put a tithe and an offering in the plate that, Lord, uh, your church, your storehouse might be full. Lord, thank you for those that went out and knocked on doors and invited folks to come. And thank you, Lord, for those that have prayed and those that have sought your face and those that come ready to worship this morning. God, thank you for all that you have done but Lord, we realize without your touch, we're not much. So Father, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel. I pray that, Lord, you would speak to hearts now. And I pray you'd magnify the darling Son of God. And God, I pray that, Lord, your will would be accomplished. Forgive us where we have sinned and come short of your glory. Forgive us of those stubborn times in our life, God. Lord, they've been many with me. God, I pray you'd help us to yield ourselves to the Holy Ghost of God and we'll thank you for it, for it's in the wonderful and holy and glorious name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to three things as a way of introduction. The first thing I would like for you to see is Paul is writing this epistle under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to this church at Thessalonica. I'd like you to see the clarifying of doctrine. 
You have to understand in this time there was a sect of the Jews called the scribes uh, and the scribes believed that there was no resurrection of the dead. They believed once you died, you died like a dog or any other animal, you just ceased to exist. And here we find a clarification or clarifying of doctrine. Notice as Paul says again in verse 13, brethren, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Ignorant, he's not being rude, he's not being crude, he's not uh, uh, telling somebody that they, they have a handicap. He is referring to that they were not, uh, uh, they had not been taught the truth. They were not, uh, uh, they have not been uh, uh, setting under the, the truth of, uh, of the teachings of God and they were ignorant to the things of God. They had believed a lie and he is about ready to enlighten them uh, as to the very truth that they so long to understand. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or those that have died. He says that you sorrow not. See, they, they had no hope. Their loved ones died, they had no hope. Listen, it's a terrible thing to have a loved one pass away. It's even more terrible for them to pass away and them not leave a testimony of salvation. But if you have a loved one who has passed on and they left the testimony of salvation, they lived for God, and you knew they were saved. Uh, we have hope today. Uh, not only am I going to see Jesus someday, but I'm going to see my loved ones as well. What a glad reunion day. But these folks had no hope because they'd been taught there was no resurrection. They'd been taught that those that died just died. Uh, but look what he says, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. You see, the, the apostle Paul was explaining to them uh, uh, the doctrine to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, and he is saying, you don't have to worry, you have hope. Uh, if they died in Jesus, God's going to bring them with him. They're here, they're with him right now. What a blessing to have that hope today. Uh, and he's clarifying the doctrine uh, that you do have a soul. Can I say, every person in this building is eternal. Now, these bodies aren't. Mine's fading fast. Hmm? These old bodies are going back to the dust of the earth they were formed from. But your soul, who you really are, will live forever. It will live in one of two places. It will live in a place that God has went to prepare. A beautiful celestial city. Uh, called New Jerusalem. You'll live with the Lord forever. What a blessing to have that hope, to know that uh, I'll go back to the Creator, the one that made me, and I'll spend all my days uh, 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 for all of eternity with Him. Huh? He said, uh, uh, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, he said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I've gone to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. What a blessing to know. Brother, brother uh, uh, Philip, you sing that song, I hold a clear title to a mansion. And you do. You've been saved by the good grace of God, born again, born into the family of God, and he's went to prepare a mansion for you. What a blessing. To have that hope, to know I'll spend it. Everything man strives for down here won't even compare to everything that's there, and we own it all. Huh? What a blessing, huh? To have eternal life. But those who don't trust Christ, they're eternal as well. You see, Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, and he died and shed his blood to become our sacrifice. He was buried and rose again, and if we will truly uh, repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept Him as our personal Savior, we'll be saved. Amen. Brother James, you sing that song, uh, Whosoever will may come. Hallelujah. He made a provision even for me. Whosoever means me. Hallelujah. Amen. But if you reject the Lord Jesus, and you don't accept Him as your personal Savior, you see, you were conceived in iniquity, and you are a sinner. And there's only one cleansing for sin, the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. That's why He died for you. But if you don't accept Him as your Savior, you'll spend all of eternity paying for your own sins. And a terrible place not created for the soul of man. Created to inflict punishment on Satan and the devil and all his angels, his imps. But you'll have to suffer in the lake of fire because you would not let Jesus pay for your sins. And we, we see he clarifies the doctrine. 
about those who sleep in Christ. But we also find that he shows us the coming of Christ. Look what he says in verse number 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of our archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. He's talking about the catching away of the saints or the rapture of the church. He said there's coming a day when uh, there's going to be a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God's going to sound, uh, and Christ is going to come from the right hand of the throne of God, uh, and all those saints that have died in Christ are going to come with Him, uh, and the dead in Christ shall rise, the graves are going to bust open. Uh, hey, uh, those bodies that have been buried uh, are going to be brought back together, and they're going to be reunited with the soul in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and they're going to be changed and given a, fast, a body fashioned like the Son of God. Uh, they're going to get up out of the grave and we which are alive and remain that haven't died. Hey, we might be even before this service is over. The trump will sound. Hallelujah. Hey, we'll rise to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, Now this is not his literal second coming. He is coming back to this earth. He doesn't come back to the earth here. We rise to meet him. And then we come back with him seven years later. I don't have time to get into all that this morning. But hallelujah, we'll rule and reign with him. Huh? What a blessing. We see the coming of the Lord. See the clarifying of the doctrine. But notice the comforting of the saints. Hmm? Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Verse 18, he says, Comfort everybody with the thought the Lord's coming. We talked about it in Sunday school, Brother Mark. The end of the book of Revelation, the final, final prayer in the Bible. John says, After the Lord said, I come quickly. John says, Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hmm? He said, Come on. I wonder how many of you got up this morning saying, Come on, Lord, take us home today. He said, Comfort one another with the thought the Lord's a coming. Did you get up and say, Lord, today would be a beautiful day for you to come and snatch us out of here? Now, I brought this out in my Sunday school lesson. The reason, Miss Jackie, we don't pray that way is that we got too many stakes down here in the the world. There's still somebody we want to see saved, or there's still something we want to attain, or there's still uh, something we want to accomplish, or there's still uh, uh, something else we want to view, or something, and we've got our minds on these worldly things and not our eyes on Him. In 1 John chapter 3, it talks about if you're praying and seeking Him to come, He says, Whosoever have this hope purifieth himself, even as He is pure. Hmm? When you're praying, come Lord Jesus, guess what? You're ready to go. The reason you didn't get up this morning and say, Come Lord Jesus, you wasn't ready to go. Hmm? That's to comfort us. Hey, anybody besides me look around and see this world's in a mess? Can I help you something? Everything's fine in heaven today. It ought to be comforting to know uh, in a moment, in a twinkling eye, we're going to leave the mess behind and go to glory. Huh? That ought to comfort you. Uh, They can have it all. I really don't care. Uh, Fox News, CNN, Republicans, Democrats, Communists, I don't care. They can have it. I'm out of here. Hallelujah. Huh? That comforts me. Say, oh, it's getting bad. That means it's going to be good. Huh? So what are you going to preach on out of this text today, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked, huh? Look over at verse 16. For the Lord himself. Notice he's not going to send an angel after us. He's not sending Peter after us or Paul or uh, John or James, huh? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, huh? I got to thinking about that. Got to thinking about the Lord himself coming, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. I want to preach on this thought this morning. The trump's about to blow. Huh? The trump's about to blow, friends. Huh? Hey, I'm not the brightest light bulb in the bunch, uh, but hey, uh, through the pages of the Word of God and looking around this world spinning out of course and things are lining up just the way God said they would, uh, hey, it's about to blow. We're just about out of here. Uh, We're in the last of the last minutes, seconds of the last hours of the last days. Uh, uh, 
friend, you ought to get ready. You ought to be excited. Uh, I believe Gabriel's wet in his lips. Uh, he's got the trumpet in hand. I believe he's about ready to blow her out. Uh, I believe even Doc Severson can't blow one like Gabriel is. Uh, he's going to blow. The archangel's going to shout. Uh, we're going to hear the Lord say, Come up hither uh, and I'm out of here. Hallelujah. Hey, uh, the trump's about to blow. Uh, Say, preacher, how do you know the trump's about to blow? I'm glad you ask. Uh, we know it's about to blow, first of all, because of the apostate times. The apostate times. Uh, apostasy is the final stages of sin. And we see all that's going on in this world uh, and see we're in the apostate times. And the Bible tells us right before the Lord comes, uh, it's going to be full of apostasy. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says in verse number 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. The last days. Now see if these things don't sound familiar. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. I've never seen selfishness like today. You know? America used to be the most giving nation in the world. Now we're the most taking nation in the world. You know half of Americans get some kind of governmental assistance. Hmm. Our America as we knew it will never be the same because Americans are too busy taking instead of giving. Hmm. Uh, we're lovers of our own selves. I don't care about you as long as I get mine. That's the mentality of today. My right to my claim to myself. Uh, hey, you can do whatever you want to. Just leave me alone. Let me do what I want to because I'm me and I'm special. Huh? We love our own selves. Huh? But he goes on to say this. Huh? Covetous. That means we want everything, but well, we don't have to pay for it. Huh? We're covetous. God help. Brother Pete, get a new truck, and I'm going to covet it. I want his new truck. That's why he didn't get a new truck. You got a new Volkswagen. Been there, done that, had the Volkswagen. So that's all right. You can have that, huh? Huh? No, we're covetous. We want everything everybody else has got. Young people get married and they want everything mom and dad has and mom and dad worked 30 years to get it but young people want it right away. Huh? We're covetous. Huh? Amen. Boasters. Proud. Boy, that's us. Oh, yeah. We're the greatest nation on the earth. Prove it. We're not education wise. We're about 12th. Japanese, Chinese, Germans. They're a lot smarter in math and science than we are. How about manufacturing wise? We don't make anything in America anymore. Yeah. Automobile industry and, and, and airline industry, you know, that's about all we make anymore. We don't make clothes. We don't make TVs. We don't make radios. We don't make tools. We don't make anything anymore. Huh? No. But we're proud. We're blasphemers. Yeah. We'll blaspheme God. Amen. The things of God. We want to take in God we trust off our money. We want to take God out of the pledge of the flag. Uh, we, we, we say that you can't say anything about God, but we let Muslims and Islam all over America today. Mm -hmm. Disobedient to parents. Go read Ephesians chapter 5 and 6. You'll find that wives need to learn how to, they're supposed to live, and husbands will learn how they're supposed to live, and children will learn how they're supposed to live, and you can live a long time if you're thankful and obedient to your parents. Why well, not today? Well, young people today think their parents are stupid. Uh, young people today, they, they want it their way, and they don't care what the parents say anymore. They talk about their parents like they're dogs. All their parents did was give them a nice roof, take care of them, give them clean clothes, wash their clothes for them, feed them, take care of them, invest about half a million dollars in them from the time they're born to the time they uh, uh, go away to college, and all they want to do is talk bad about their parents. Hmm? Go right ahead, and you've got an early grave coming. That's what the Bible says. Huh? Well, we're disobedient to parents. Sneak around, do whatever we want to do, don't care about what the parents think. Hmm? You're welcome. That's what the Bible says. Unthankful. This is the most unthankful generation I've ever seen. Take everything for granted. Hmm? Unthankful. Uh, unholy. We live in an unholy day. Hmm. Used to people respected the things of God, the men of God, the churches of God. Now they're unholy, don't think anything about the things of God. Huh? 
without natural affection. These two people were kindly, affectionate toward other people, tender-hearted. Somebody had a need to community to rise around them. Nowadays, you can't hardly watch a news program to find out about somebody shooting somebody else, not thinking anything about it, killing somebody over tennis shoes, kids going in schools, shooting people in schools, uh, young women having babies, leaving them in a bathroom. No natural affection. The truest affection in the world is the affection of a mother for its child. Uh, young women having babies, leaving grandma and grandpa to raise them so they can go off and live however they want to. Not, without natural affection, that's where we live, huh? Uh, truce breakers. Well, used to your word was your bond. Now people lie and break their word all the time. Look how many peace treaties we've had in this world, huh? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. False cuters, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded. We're there. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Prove it to you. Huh? Electricity can go out and nobody could have church on a Sunday and nobody would care. Just people go to that church. You let something happen where you can't have the National Football League on TV today. Yeah, come on. Yeah. They'd, they'd be protesting Congress. Find out why the lights went out in the Super Bowl. Huh? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Even churches will bring in widescreen TVs on Super Bowl Sunday to get people to come to church because otherwise they won't come to their church. Because they love the Super Bowl more than they love the thought of heaven. Apostate times, huh? The Bible says in Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You know what the days of Noah were? Man done wickedly in every imaginable thing that he could think of. Uh, they were giving in marriage, eating and drinking, uh, uh, divorce and, and swapping wives, uh, uh, same-sex relationships. Uh, 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 anything went. There was no uh, uh, constraint. There was no... Uh, 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 boundaries, just whatever. If it felt good, do it. And God repented that he made man. And he called Noah to build a boat. And Noah preached for 120 years. They thought he was crazy. But you know what? God put Noah and his family in the boat, shut the door, and it rained. Destroyed all of mankind. Hmm? It says, as it was in Noah's days, that's what it'll be is when the Lord comes back. You know what it is today? I'll do whatever I want. I could care less what God thinks. That's the society we live in today. Used to, the politicians would come to the churches and see what God thought about it before they would vote on it. Now they want to do away with us. Because we get in their way. They make fun of us. We're the butt of every one of their jokes. Obama, when he ran for president, said, Oh yeah, that Bible-thumping, gun-toting uh, God crowd. Yeah. Afraid of, afraid of folks that believe the Bible. Huh? We're in his way for his agenda. Can I say his administration has said people that believe the Bible and believe in God are terrorists. That's what he's called us. Terrorist. He's putting us in the same category as people that blew up the Twin Towers on 9-11. I've got news for President Obama. We don't seek to take life. We seek to see folks saved. We seek for them to get eternal life. Right. We're not here to hurt. We're here to help. Amen. We're not here to point the finger. We're here to point them in the right direction. Yeah. And His name is Jesus. Yeah. That's right. He said, nah, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto you. We just point folks to Him. Uh, Amen. But we live in apostate times. That's how I know the Trump's about to blow. Things are wicked, friends. They're not getting any best, better. They're getting worse and worse and worse. Turned on the news the other night for the first time all week. Uh, and you know what was happening? Uh, three people got shot in Lower Price Hill. Uh, hey, it goes on every day. There's no conscience uh, or care about life. Uh, uh, there's nobody that's concerned about fellow man. They're just out there uh, doing all kinds of heinous things. They're getting worse. Uh, the Trump's about to blow. Because we live in apostate times. But not only apostate times. I know the Trump's about to blow because we live in apathetic times. The Bible says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. Matthew 24, 12 says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Used to, people loved one another, cared about one another. It's waxing cold. 
Huh? You know what's happened? We've seen so much and we've been desensitized to sin so much and because we've been taken advantage of so much, now we don't care as much. But not only that, in Matthew 25 in the parable of his second coming, this is what the Lord Jesus said in that parable of the ten virgins. In Matthew 25, 5 says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. We live in apathetic times because even God's people have went to sleep. You know why you didn't get up and say, Lord, come today? Because you're asleep spiritually. You're really not looking for him to come today. Oh, you know he's coming. You just don't think he's coming today. Well, he's coming as a thief in the night. He comes when people aren't expecting him, and people aren't expecting him because they're asleep. How many of you really did the will of God every minute of every day this week? That's what I thought. Nobody's hand went up including mine, because we're all lulled a little bit of sleep. We live in apathetic times. Oh, we know God can do great things. We just don't realize he chooses to do it through his church. And we become apathetic. We really buy into the mentality, just come to churches serving God. No, this is worship. Serving God happens outside these doors. We live in apathetic times. How much is really getting done for Jesus in our lives? Every one of us is so busy. How many of you like to have about five more hours a day? Yeah. Let's think. Why would we want five more hours? To get more done? No, to sleep more. We're apathetic. Hmm? One thing I've found once you get... The age I am. You can't sleep like you used to. My sorry three children, man, they can, they can go out for hours and hours and days, man. Huh? We get apathetic to the things of God. Look at your schedule and look how much of it really doesn't evolve around God. It's because we're apathetic. We live in apathetic times. That's how I know the Trump's about to blow. Hmm? Can I say, I know the trump's about to blow because we live in arrogant times. We think we're all right with God. And he said that's the way it'll be right before he comes. Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 says, Because thou sayest I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. We're arrogant. We think we are revived. And nobody in this building seen true revival. We live in arrogant times. Now, I'm not a mid-tribber. Anybody know what a mid-tribber is? There's popular teaching today. Now, we believe the Bible. And the Bible makes it clear the Lord's going to take His church out of here before the Great Tribulation period. There's going to be a seven-year period on earth where total anarchy takes over after the church is called out of here and the Holy Ghost is gone. But there are preachers who have adopted the philosophy or ideology of mid-trip that the Lord's going to let the church live through the first half of the tribulation and then take us out. I don't believe that. I believe the Bible. But the Lord may let the church go through a little persecution before it takes us out. You know why? To purge us. Because we've had it so good for so long and we've taken for granted the blessings of God. We think we're increased with goods and have need of nothing. God might just let us see just how much we need Him. It'd do us real good to get real grateful for all that God does for us. But we live in arrogant times. We don't think we need God until somebody's sick or bills need to be paid. Hmm? Somebody gets out of the will of God, then we need God. Hmm? that's very arrogant. Do you realize he holds your breath in his hands? We need him every hour, as the songwriter wrote. The trump's about to blow because we live in arrogant times. Can I say the trump's about to blow because we live in artificial times. We live in a time when falseness abounds and truth is hidden. The Bible says in the last days, Matthew 24, verse 11, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. There's a bunch that have a form. You know what a form is. 
It's a shell that's hollow on the inside. There's a lot of forms out there. There's a lot of falseness being out there. There's a lot of false Bibles, a lot of false churches, a lot of false preachers, a lot of false doctrine. A lot of that's going on today. And it just tells us the Trump's about to blow. Do you think it's by any accident the devil's been crafty that right now, today, there's over 300 different religions and denominations in America? Look at all the different versions of the Bible. Go over here to the family bookstore. You have a harder time finding one that's true than picking out the false one. All you got to do is throw a dart. You hit a false one. Huh? Look at all the false ways of worship today. You know, I, I know I'm getting old. But I'm not as old as you. <laughs> yes, I am. But listen, Brother Ray, When did people think coming to church was like going to a rock concert? Man, I was always taught you come to church, man, you dressed up, you look good, you come to church to worship, you, you respected church, you respected the things of God. And you see some people come. It's an amazing thing. You go to the restaurant and they say, you came from church? Now I know why. It's not that they're so shocked that people went to church, they're so shocked people went to church dressed up. Because all these other crowd comes and they look like a bunch of bums. Huh? Men don't know how to pull their pants up. Don't want a belt. Huh? They don't know. I mean, preachers in this area don't know what a collar is anymore. Unless it's turned around backwards. Huh? I, I mean, they don't wear shoes that you shine. Women don't know what a skirt or a dress is anymore. People just don't, don't look in a respectful way towards church. Huh? Because they've been taught it's okay. Here's the philosophy. Just come as you are. God loves you just the way you are. He does. But once you come to know Him, He changes you from the inside out. Huh? I'm glad I'm not what I used to be. Hmm? I used to be a bum. Now I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amen. Huh? Amen. I used to like to hang out in the low places, but I, I'm not there today because God's changed me. And I'm headed to a high place. Are you listening? Huh? But there's a lot of falseness being taught. That's all these false churches got to have all these campaigns and movements all the time. You listen to... Uh, uh, people, and uh, you know, I, I guess more so with me because the kids are so involved in school and I'm around so many people and they start asking about church and it amazes me. But Terry, you know what they never ask me? They never ask me, what's your preaching like? Brother Clint, I never hear that. But you know what I hear? What kind of Bible studies do you have for ladies? What kind of programs do you have for the youth? You hear that kind of stuff. But the Bible says that God chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. But they never ask about preaching. They never say, hey, do you ever bring in some wild preacher from down somewhere who comes and just preaches and paint off the walls? Never hear that. Huh? Occasionally they'll ask, do you have a rock band? Well, we don't have a band, but we like singing about the rock, the rock of ages. Huh? But they, they just, what is going on? They've been taught a bunch of falseness. We're to worship God in the beauty of holiness. The songs are to edify the church and exalt the Lord Jesus. The preaching is to come from the Word of God. It's to exhort, it's to edify, it's to encourage, it's to rebuke and reprove with all long suffering and doctrine. Hey, it's to be instant in season, out of season, whether or not the world likes it or not, it's still true and we're still to stand upon it, my dear friends. But there's a lot of falseness going on. It's artificial. Huh? They say they know God. They say they're believers. Well, they do believe in something. And it does have a spirit. That's why John said, try the spirits whether they be of God. We're to try them with the Bible. And if they go against the Bible, it's not of the Holy Ghost. 
The Holy Spirit always uses the Bible. He wrote it. Pen it down. Are you listening? Because of the artificial times, I know the trumpet's about to blow. So much falseness. So much falseness. Can I say? Because of the appeasing times, the trumpet's about to blow. So what are you talking about, preacher? 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. 2 Timothy 3, 7 says, Ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. We have to appease everybody today. Everything has to be politically correct. You're not allowed to offend anybody. Well, I want to help you with something. If the Word of God offends you, you'll have to be offended. Take it up with God. Amen. But we're not allowed to do that today. Today, you've got to appease everybody. everybody you've got to soothe everybody's feelings. Hmm. Kingsman had it best in that song that came out in the 70s. Somebody didn't even shake my hand. you got to make sure you shake everybody's hand. Tell them they look good today. Oh, Brother Phil, good to see you, buddy. Hey, good to see you. Good boy, good boy. What a treat. What a treat. That's what I do to my dog. Huh? But yet, we have to appease everybody's feelings. Now, Brother Doug shouldn't have said that. Brother Bell's down in Moorhead preaching today. You know, Brother Bell's turned up a hornet's nest when he was here one time, Sister Bell. He said a very, very unnice word from the pulpit. It was a whole lot nicer than the word I use. When I found that out, I told them the word I use, and they left. Huh? Why? Because you've got to appease everybody. Because everybody wears their feelings on their shirt sleeves. Huh? Nobody wants to deal in absolutes nowadays. Everything has to be gray. Well, with the Bible, everything's black and white. Amen. There are no gray areas. Amen. Let God be true. Yes. Every man a liar. Huh? Our yeas ought to be yeas and our nays nays. Yes. Huh? Now listen, I deliberately don't want to hurt anybody. I deliberately want to show you the love of God. But can I tell you something? I've never enjoyed spanking my children, but I have spanked my children so that they learned that there are certain things that are acceptable and that are not acceptable. And truly by spanking them, I'm showing them love. The worst thing I could do is let them live however they want to and then cause harm to themselves. That's not loving them. Just the op opposite. That is not caring at all. When my children were little, I did not let them play on a busy street. They might get hit by a car. I did not leave them unsupervised in a park. They might get uh, uh, abducted. Huh? And God loves us the same way. Sometimes it's a stern message. But He loves us, and He knows what's best for us. And He's really not concerned about our feelings today. He's concerned about our future. But we live in appeasing times. Hmm. Sister Mary, church house be full today if I had more spiritual pacifiers. Where you at, Thad? Remember when you got me that? Man, how long has that been? 16, 17 years ago. Neither one of us had gray hair. I didn't know that. Huh? Brother Thad, in his wonderful sense of humor, one time got me a pastor survival kit. I opened it up, it had diapers and pacifiers and baby bottles and all kinds of stuff, huh? But listen, God didn't call me to go around making sure that you're appeased. God called me to preach and pastor this church. And I know the Trump's about ready to blow because people want to be appeased. They want to be made to feel special. And Joel will make you feel special because something good is going to happen to you today. Just pay $10 to come in and hear me preach. And then, uh, uh, well, he's not a preacher. He's a speaker. And then, uh, 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 you know, buy my book on your way out. And in the meantime, leave an offering. Listen, I'm not interested in your money. I'm interested in your heart. And your heart being right with God. But we live in appeasing times. That's how I know the trumpet's about to blow. Can I say this? 
We live in appealing times. Romans 13, 11 says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we, we believe. These are appealing times. This ought to appeal to you today. If you're saved, you ought to be excited. You ought to be excited that Jesus is coming. You ought to be excited we live in appeasing times and artificial times and apathetic times and apostate times. You ought to be excited about that because the Bible's coming true right before us. It's unfolding right before our lives. Uh, no generation has ever been as close to the second coming of the Lord as us. Uh, we ought to be excited. Uh, hey, uh, when I first got saved back in 1974, uh, they talked about the rapture and the Lord coming back and folks believed it was going to happen then. Uh, a lot of those people are in heaven tonight uh, or this morning, but I got good news. Uh, I may be of the generation that gets to see it come to pass. Uh, I might even be preaching when the trump sounds. What a blessing that would be. Uh, I want to let you know uh, these ought to be a time that appeals to us as Christians to wake up because uh, God's on his way. Uh, and I say we ought to wake up this morning. The trump's about to blow. We ought to stand up this morning. Stand up, be a counter. I love that song Sister Marcy sings. I will stand and pledge allegiance to the Lamb. We ought to stand up. Say, I'm one of his. Count me of that crowd. I want, to, I want folks to know that I've trusted in Christ. I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. As Brother Phil says, I'm on my way with the hammer down. Huh? Amen. Go on. As quick as I can. The Lord calls me home, huh? I used to love that song when Jesus calls me, call me gone. Huh? Out of here. See ya. He's a coming. That ought to appeal to us. Huh? That ought to wake up. That ought to stand up. Can I say this? In all due respect, in appeasing your feelings. We got a man up. Too many wimps in the house of God. Got a man up. Uh, I was watching the other night, Friday night. It's cold. There's a beauty when your kids play sports, but I like the one Sydney plays best because it's indoors. <laughs> Freezing to death. Thanking God for whoever invented them hand warmer things you buy for a buck. Man, I got them in both pockets. Got them in my shoes. You know, got them behind my ears. I'm freezing. And I'm looking along the sidelines and there's some kids that's got talent. Brother Mark, they're not a bit more hurt than anybody else. I don't care who you are. You play a contact sport. Look, Trent plays soccer. They play hard. I, you know, I used to say soccer was for sissy. I come watch you guys play. There's a lot of contact in that sport. You can run, man. You better keep running. You're going to catch him someday if he smarts off to you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or learn to throw something very hard. But listen, you play a contact sport. I don't care what it is. You get halfway through the season, everybody's hurt. Everybody's bruised. Everybody's nicked up. Huh? I was looking at some of them boys walking around acting like they got knee problems and shoulder problems. Oh, yeah. Man up. Get out there on the field. Strap it up or go home and get you a lollipop. Huh? Man up. All I know is I got one over there that played a whole season on a leg needing surgery and he played the whole season on the leg until the season was over. Last year I told him we're going to have to shut you down. He played the whole season. Huh? The other leg. Had a vertebrae fractured in his back. Played. Why? Because he manned up. His dad in the background telling him, hey, you get out there, I'm going to kick you. No. No, he's like, dad, get out of my way or I'll kick you. I'm playing. Huh? He manned up. Hmm? Can I say, I don't care who you are. You're saved by the good grace of God. You're going to suffer persecution. That's what the Bible says. You're going to face things. You're going to have problems. You're going to have trials. You're going to have sickness. You're going to have... Man up. People are dying and going to hell and they're depending on you and I to have God on us and to wake up and to stand up so they can see a difference and they can see something with some truth to it, some life to it. And we ought to man up. The choir saying, He's coming soon. Everybody's sitting there. The choir saying, Wall of Prayer. Some of you acted like you was praying, but you was really sleeping. <laughs> huh? Stephen Tammy sang. He knows what I need. 
Some of you look like, yeah, he knows I need a nap. You got a TV hangover. You stayed up too late last night. You didn't come ready to worship. Some of you, all you think about is all your problems. How bad you got it. Miss Lynn sang about being stubborn. That should have hit about all of us this morning. I'm preaching the trumpets about ready to blow and you're all like, will you shut up? i got to go eat, catch a game. Well, the Bengals don't even come on to four today, so shut up, huh? Dad, you ought to be excited. Bridgewater finally figured out how to hit somebody yesterday, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. At least you haven't lost as many as his team's lost. Huh? How can you lose one game and drop 12 spots in the standings? Bunch of communists. <laughs> huh? Man up! Everybody's got something going on. Man up and be real. Come to the house of God ready to worship. Maybe somebody here today doesn't know the Lord. They're looking around at you and saying, if that's what it is, I don't want it. Think of that. It's an appealing time. We ought to be excited. This might be the last service we get to come to before we get to go to heaven. We ought to be excited. Can I say there is no praying in heaven? You want to talk to the Lord, you just walk up and talk to Him. Amen. Huh? There is no walking by faith because we'll see Him as He is. This might be the last time we get to trust Him by faith, so why don't we just man up and do it? It's an appealing time. Can I say this? It's an assertive time. It's time we get involved. It's time we exclaim and tell others, Jesus is coming, He's coming soon. It's time we start living it. It's time that folks see something different in us. Trump's about to blow. Hmm? Listen, a lot of people say, oh, I'm not an I told you so person. I am. And when it blows on the way to meet him, I'm going to say, told you so! About to blow. About to blow. Let me ask you a question. Friends, I'm telling you, even closer than I think if we are, we're there. The Lord's on His way. It could happen any day. Let me ask you a question. You ready to meet Him? Are you ready to meet Him? Say, oh, I'm saved. I didn't ask you that. Are you ready to meet Him? See, the Bible says we must all give an account of ourselves to the Lord. We must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. Give an account of the deeds done in this body, whether they're good or evil. You ready to meet Him? Hey, with all that you carried in here this morning loaded up on you, you ready to meet Him? You ready to meet Him? He's coming. Trump's about to blow. You ready to meet Him? Hmm? Maybe you're here today and you don't know if you're saved or not. Friend, I'd get ready. I'd make that, I'd make that thing sure. Hmm? Over there in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Now are we the sons of God. I don't have to wait to die to see if I am. I am right now. Say, so how do you know? Because I was there when he saved me. Yeah. Amen. I was there when I met him. Changed my life. Huh? Friend, if you can't go back to a place where you met him, I'd get, I'd get that thing settled today. Say, preacher, I don't know how to be saved. In a moment, I'm going to have an invitation. You come. I'll take the Bible. I'll take all the time necessary. I'll show you what the Bible says so you can know that you know that you know that you know. Right. Your name's written down in heaven. You're going to heaven. That's the only thing that's important today, whether or not you know, because the trump's about to sound. Boy, I'd get that thing settled. You ready to meet him? Christian, you ready to meet him? The week you've had, have you trusted him this week? You ready to meet him? You prepared? He's coming. Hmm? The way you've treated his service this morning, you ready to meet him? Hmm? Hmm? You ready to meet him? He's coming. Trump may blow. Huh? Say, well, I'll get right tonight. We may not have tonight, friend. I'm telling you, we're close. Today's the day. It's what the Bible says. Now's the accepted time. Today's the day of salvation. I'd get it settled right now. Are you ready? Oh, you ought to be. The trumpet's about to blow. It's about ready to happen. Could happen any time. Say, preach, I've heard that all my life. Yep, and we're one second closer. He's about ready to come. Everything's in order. There's not one thing that needs to happen in prophecy to happen in order for the Lord to come. My dear friends, he's just waiting on the Father to look to him and say, go get your bride, and he's coming. Are you ready? Boy, I'd get ready today. Let's all stand, Brother Ray, come and get a song.